All right, everybody. Um, so today we're going to go over the troubleshooting and diagnostic cycles of this Maytag washer that I have here. And um, it's going to be part of a series that I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I just, it's harder for me to do it just standing here by myself instead of having a class in front of me. But I want to go over the diagnostics, how to get into the diagnostics, and how we use the diagnostics, how important some of that is for us. Because with these new electronic machines, it's harder to troubleshoot than if it's just a standard machine with a mechanical timer. Those are being disappearing very fast. That you can, I don't even think they sell very many machines now with a mechanical timer. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the actual service manual. Um, I'm in what we call the diagnostics and troubleshooting page. And when you guys are working on your machines, one of the things you're going to do every time you grab a washing machine is I want you to hook up the machine and I want you to run it through a cycle and then I want you to learn that you do the diagnostics and then when you're done working on the machine you have to run it through a cycle again to make sure everything's working when you're done. So. Um, when you're going through diagnostics on here, one of the important things about the diagnostics, I see a lot of people read like step one and step two, and they go over and they're, they're trying to go into diagnostics before they read step three. Some of these steps, you only have a few seconds between the first step to the next step. If you don't pre-read and understand all of the steps, it's going to be hard for you to go into the diagnostic steps and follow them clearly. So it says, be sure the washer's in standby mode. So let me go ahead and plug this washer in. Should have had it plugged in before, but I forgot. I was more concerned about the uh, camera not being clear. Okay, so if you look here, I connected the washer, and the first thing it says is that there is a power failure when you first plug it in. Now, they want that machine in standby mode. What does standby mode mean? Yeah, so even though it says power failure here, what they want you to do is just cancel that out. Just go ahead and press power and turn it off. And so now our display is completely blank. That's standby mode. Okay? So if you unplugged it, plugged it back in and display came up, just get right out of that. So that was the very first thing we need to do. Now we want to select any three buttons except for the power and follow the steps. Let's take a look at this screen here. And this is a designation of display, similar to what you did on, on the refrigerator the other day, where they want you to pick any one of these three buttons except for the one that says power. And what they want you to do is they want you to press them in a sequence, like, like a combination code. So when we look at it here, it says press at least the first button, press at least the second button, press at least the third button, and then repeat this three times. So you could pick these in any order, key one, key two, key three, four. You don't have to do it in any specific order. I could go one, two, three, and then I do it two more times. One, two, three, one, two, three. And at that point, I should be entering into the diagnostic or the service mode. Okay, so let's go back to here. So we're gonna have press three buttons, we're going to do a total of three times. If the service test mode has been activated successfully, this area for service technicians only will display on the, on the screen. And then uh, follow the instructions shown on the screen for navigation into the service mode. 
Well, let's take a look at over here before we do it at the different types of service modes that you can get into. You get into the factory diagnostics, system information, fault history, and service diagnostics. So let's just talk about what each one is. Factory diagnostics is factory cycles, DLMS calibration cycle. DLMS calibration here is that whenever you do any service on this washing machine, you change the motor, you change a control board, or you change other electrical components inside this machine, it has to run through a calibration mode. This is one thing that Whirlpool does. I know I said this is a Maytag washing machine, but Maytag is part of the Whirlpool family. So you have to run that through, or otherwise the machine could come up with errors or may not run efficiently. Um, it'll also give you connectivity status. Some of these machines have access to the internet. System version. Why, why do you need to know what version that machine is? What, what, it, what will be the importance of knowing the version of that machine? Because the um, fault codes and you know, the diagnostic code procedure may be different. Because it's a different version. Maybe the same model is a different version of the model. Not so much the fault codes and diagnostics, but when the machine is first manufactured, let's just say it's version number one, it may be found that this machine has a problem. One of the problems with this particular washer is the capacitor. For the motor. The capacitor, I think even this one had a bad capacitor when it came in, and the capacitor causes all kinds of failures on this washing machine. I had one guy change the main board and change the motor, and he was getting errors saying hall sensor error. Do you guys know what a hall sensor is? Hall sensor is a sensor that senses the speed and rotation of the motor. Okay, but he's getting a hall sensor error. He says, I changed the board. I changed the motor and I said, well, if you look at the shifter on the motor, we'll look at the diagrams later. If you look at the shifter of the motor, that's the part that's actually sensing the speed and rotation of the motor. I said, that's the part that's probably failing if it says it cannot sense the motor running. And if you already changed the motor and the board, the shifter, what senses it is probably the part. He calls me back and turns around and says, I put the shifter in, I'm still getting the same error. So I said, I don't know what else you're gonna replace, guess what? He called Whirlpool for technical support and they said change the capacitor on the motor. Mm -hmm. So here you had a failure. Why would the capacitor on the motor cause that failure? If the board isn't reading or adjusting for the ferrets in the capacitor? No, the board, the board doesn't test the capacitor. What's the purpose of the capacitor on the washing machine? To help start the motor. And even though we changed the motor, and we changed the board, the motor wasn't running. Or the motor was giving us an error. And the only thing left was the capacitor to get that motor going. Now, I don't know if he's gone back and installed that part, but I've heard from other people that they've seen bad capacitors, and I've seen this with bad capacitors from the factory. It may work for a couple of months and then the capacitor is failing, okay? But knowing the version number of the system, going back to that question that I asked, is that sometimes the manufacturer says, hey, you know, we've had a lot of bad door lock mechanisms on this machine, and we've changed the door lock mechanism, but we had to add a little communication in the programming of the board. So we need to make sure that if you have a problem, you need to update the board to version three or higher, or otherwise that lock mechanism might not work. And this is just an example, not that it's that problem. So knowing the version, that you would have to know the version to know whether the board inside the machine was already updated for the newer parts. And when you go to the manufacturer's website, they have service pointers, and service pointers tell you if you have this problem with the machine, you need to upgrade the computer board with that diagnostic center. Okay, and HMI version is just the human interface, the user interface version. So it tells you the system version and the user interface version, the, the, the display on the front of the washing machine here. Okay, oh, I uh, accidentally turned it on. Let me power back off. Okay, so, 
uh, fault history, clear fault history, fault history, and fault code display. All right. So why do you want a clear fault history? Yes, sir. What a clear fault history because another service can service the technician comes with a machine that they won't see the fault, fault history. They won't see the fault codes and they think that there's something still wrong with it. So if you clear the fault history, it won't be there. So it won't, so it won't confuse the service technician. Very good. So, so what he's saying, if you guys didn't hear him or don't understand, is that when you go into fault history, you may have three different faults found in the machine. Bad pump, bad motor, bad this and that. And you're like, wow, all these things are wrong with this machine. But someone may have come and serviced it before and repaired that fault. Well, a lot of times the board doesn't know that that was repaired, so it doesn't erase the memory. So before you just go in there and see, oh, these are the faults inside this machine. This is what I got to replace. What, what I recommend is you go in and you make note of all the faults that you found in there, clear them, and then run the machine through this diagnostic of troubleshooting and see if the fault returns. Because if the fault returns and comes back, then we know for sure that's a problem that's still existing in the machine. Because if we cleared it and it's already been repaired, it should not return, okay? So clearing that fault history, we don't clear it right away, we make note of them, take a picture with your phone, write them down, and then we see if those faults return. Uh, service diagnostic, it tests the user interface, component activation. So component activation is, I can go into this machine and I can tell the hot water to come on, the cold water to come on, I can make the motor spin, I can make it do many different things. So with a mechanical timer, you could turn it to fill on a washing machine and you can turn the temperature to hot or cold. But with a digital machine, you can't just turn on one specific component. Sometimes it has to run through a program before the drain pump comes on. So having the component activation, if you went to a machine that was not draining, you go to diagnostics and you go into the drain test and then you could check to see if power's at the pump or power's coming off the board or something like that. So activation is what we would use the most, the fault codes and activating the components. Now, when I go into someone's house, I don't activate every single component of the machine. I try to determine what is the fault. Is it not draining, not filling, not spinning, all these different things. Once I do that, then I will try to activate just those circuits and troubleshoot those circuits out. Sensor feedback, that's just to check the sensor and see if the sensors are working. Diagnostic cycle, if I don't know what's wrong with it. I work for some companies that sell the machine and then within 30 days some customers can return it for some reason or another and they'll send it to the service department. So now I'm inside the service center and I have no idea what's wrong with it. So I'll run it through a diagnostic cycle and see if everything's working properly as well as checking what? The fault history. Uh, demo mode. Demo mode is what the, the store salesman would put on the machine when they're selling the machine. That's what they would put in the cycle. And exit service mode. Demo mode would cause things to light up, but it wouldn't energize the water valves and the motor and everything else. Yes, sir? The diagnostic cycle, does it fully test the heater like, for like, that whole period, or does it do it for like, just a short amount? Uh, the diagnostic cycle will energize that for as long as you're in that step. Now, I don't know if this particular machine has a heater in there for water, but yeah, if you had a customer complaining it, it's not drying or it's not heating the water or anything like that, when you go into that step, it's going to send power to that component. So what you would do is you would sit there and wait and see if it reached temperature. What you would do is say, Am I getting power to that element? Am I getting an amperage draw telling me that the element is working? Because if it's drawing electrical current, I know the heating element's working. So in that case, that's how you would use it for, for testing. Is there something you had in mind as far as like a question, like specific to temperature? Yeah, like, because you know sometimes the heaters, they, they take a while to reach up the temperature in whatever water case, but if it's not fully working, I was just trying to see if diagnostics is going to let it reach the full temperature. No, it probably, uh, on this particular machine, I don't think it has an element, but on some machines that have elements, 
a lot of times you might see in the display the thermistor or the sensor that's sensing the water temperature, you would see the temperature starting to rise knowing that it's heating the water. Okay? But not every machine would have that option. Let me just turn off this AC just so the fan's not running out. So let's go into our first diagnostic step. So we're going to, we're in, we're in standby mode. So nothing's lit up. I'm going to pick three buttons. I'm going to go ahead and pick deep fill. It's a little bit blurry. I apologize. The camera moves when I plug it in the, the washer. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick deep fill, remote enable, and fabric softener. Those are the three, but I'm gonna start from the bottom up. So I'm gonna press one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then the display should say I'm in the troubleshooting mode for a technician. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. and then it displayed here. This area for technicians only. Now it says, Press deep fill. Wow, that's so blurry. I really don't like that. So I'll have to, I'll have to re redo the video or something on that. So it says press deep fill to exit. Let me just read it off of here. Push deep fill to exit or push delay to to start enter. So if I'm gonna place delay start now. Wow, it's, I'm really not happy with this camera. Can you guys read it now? No. It's a little bit clearer. But it's yeah, clear. It's like, yeah. If I go down at it, it just for some reason. Okay. How to navigate deep, remote enable left. It go. It moves too fast. How to navigate deep fill. Back cancel. So we're gonna go ahead and put deep fill. And what did that do? That took me back one step or it canceled me out. So that's how you get out of the diagnostics, okay? So we'll go back in again. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's supposed to light up. There it is, this is for technicians only. And push deep fill to exit or push delay start. So we're gonna push delay start and then deep fill to go back or delay start, okay and save. So now I'm in the service modes. One of six service modes. Right now I'm in factory diagnostics. So in factory diagnostics, we could go left or right here. And I think it's extra rinse and remote enable. Which one of these advances it? It's not advancing. Was it number two? Okay, delay start. All right, let's go back here. Let's start over again. Deep fill back. Back again. Okay, we're in service mode, factory diagnostic. Delay start supposed to enter it. I thought extra rinse was supposed to take, there it goes. Extra rinse took me to step two, system information. So I'll, I'll do the diagnostics in a minute because we don't have it hooked up for, for water. But if I click delay start, then I get the model number. And you see it says system information one of five. So there's five different things I can get when I do system information. Delay start again. It should be going to the next one. Oh, the extra rinse will get me there. It's got my serial number. Connectivity status, that would be whether or not I'm connected to the internet or network and it's we're not connected so I won't find anything there. System version, and I press here. Part version zero, serial zero. So there's no serial or, or, or information in there. And then part here and then the, these are the, the revision and serial information. This is the information on the main board. This is telling me 
the board and the version of the board. So if you had a service flash, you'd have to compare that number to the service flash to see if anything needed to be changed. Then we go here, part number, revision, serial. So the part number right there is the part number for the main control board. If you needed a control board, I don't think that, that doesn't look like a right part number, but W111000000 would be that. And that is the part number for the board. So what do I do to get out? Deep fill. Deep fill. So I back up here, and I'm back into system information. I go one more time, and now I'm factory diagnostics. I'm going to skip that one for one minute, and we're going to go to the next one. System information we just did, now fault history. Okay, that's the third one. And I click the day start to select it, fault history empty. Now, Marcus was the last one to work on it. Was there any faults in, inside the board at the time? I don't think there was. No. So this board was replaced on this unit because when they originally had it, they thought it was a bad board, but it turned out to be a bad capacitor. And there is no fault in here. So this is where you would get previous fault codes. Or if when you come to someone's house and you run through diagnostics to see if any new fault codes appear telling you what's wrong with that machine. Okay, and then go one more time here because it says one of two fault history, clear fault history. Okay, and we're, there's nothing to clear, so we're not going to try to clear it out. Oh, I pressed too many times. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. I'm back in. Do they start? And let's go to the next step. Demo mode is off. At this point here, this is where you would put the demo mode. If I know some technicians, they know how to do this. They'd go into a store and they would see it in demo mode and they would mess with the diagnostics and take it out. Don't do that. But that's the demo mode. That's only for the store, so it would light up and the customers would see it on, on the floor sample there. And then if we go one more, to exit service mode. So let's go back to... Factory Diagnostics. Now there's one of six Factory di Diagnostics, so I'm gonna enter into that. And the first one is Factory Cycle. The next one is DLMS Calibration. So this would be where you wanna go in and you wanna do calibration after you've changed any part of the machine. You'd have to go into Diagnostics, go into Calibration, and by going into Calibration, that will make the computer board and the motor and everything else do, and again, this is mainly Whirlpool products. Even though it's a Maytag, it's under the Whirlpool family. So you have to go into calibration on all the washing machines that they have nowadays. The next step here, factory calibration cycle. So then if you wanted to calibrate the machine, let's just give it a try and see what happens. So I'm running factory calibration cycle pre-wash. So one of the things that would happen is this machine would start to energize the water valves. Right now, I don't know if you can hear it. You hear it vibrating? Yeah. So the water valves are energizing right now. We don't have it connected to water. What would happen after we did the water? Door the door locked. Door locked. Then the machine may agitate or spin and run the motor. So if we look closely here, this machine now is running the motor and the basket, running it through a calibration. And this is how the two are communicating to each other. Okay? What's that running right now? The drain pump. Okay? Good. We don't need to see that because you can't see the water coming down. And this calibration cycle should only take about a minute or so, and that is when you change any control in, in, or part within this unit. I'm really gonna have to do this over again because this quality of this camera is horrible and I'm not happy with it. So now the machine's gonna start the spinning cycle. I'll go ahead and just show you guys that. 
So before, that was the agitation or the wash cycle. Then it drained out. So it filled with a little bit of water, it agitated, it drained, and now it's gonna slowly pick up speed as it's calibrating the motor to the control board here. hasn't got up to speed yet. Why does it take time for the washing machine to ramp up to speed? Why doesn't it just go right into, right into the spin? Dispersing the clothes as well. Well, in calibration, you wouldn't have clothes in it. But yes, that most of these machines, when they go in the spin cycle, they don't go from zero to 100 right away. They go and they slowly raise the speed of the machine because if the machine's off balance and it went to maximum speed right away, the machine would tear itself apart. So what it would do is it would slowly ramp up to speed and some of these machines have sensors that sense it's spinning, um, whether it's the, um, the spinning of the tub or the spinning of the motor. Some have sensors that would be located right on the, the, the tub itself, measuring whether the tub's going off balance. And sometimes, based on the motor, because if, this, if the basket's unbalanced, then the motor will not be able to get up to speed. The motor will be struggling trying to get up to speed to, to circulate that. So basically, now if you look at our display cycle here, it already went back to the word factory cycle, so it's already completed its calibration. So in a customer's home, when you change a part on this machine, that's how you would have to go in and calibrate the unit. So we saw that cycle, factory calibration, factory reset. What would you do a factory reset for? In case if they change some of the settings. And there might be a problem with the programming. Uh, I do know that GE and some other manufacturers, they have this device that you can plug in to diagnose the machine. But sometimes there may be a problem within the programming of the board Instead of having to get a whole brand new board, you can plug this device in and update the firmware of the board to the newer version instead of having to change the entire board. Now, I don't know how many technicians would want to do that because if it's a COD call, you could probably make more money changing the control board than you would be just changing the software. You know, you just plug it in, did it, okay, it's all done. Yeah, that's three hundred dollars. What? You know, how how much can you charge for updating the program within the board? I know if it's a car or something, we could probably get away with a lot, but with a washing machine, customers are going to want to pay much for you to change. It'd be better if you just change the entire control board for this unit if you did that. So that would be the factory diagnostics. I'm going to go back out and. Go in one more time. We did system information, we did fault history, service diagnostics, and let's go one more step here. Demo mode off, exit service mode. So, the most important, what are the two most important, actually there's three. What are the three most important portions that, that are in that, that program into that diagnostics? Fault. Fault codes are one that that's going to help a technician find out what's wrong with the machine. What else are there? Component testing. Diagnostic testing, where if you're going there and something's not working, you want to be able to send power from the board to that part to know if that part's not working. Otherwise, in, in normal cycles, you'd have to wait for the machine to advance to the spin cycle or the drain cycle, and that might take 20 minutes. By the time it fills up, by the time it runs through the wash cycle, and then goes in the drain, you're already there for 10 minutes. You know, our time is valuable. We want to go right to drain and see if that drain pump's running. So it's faults, diagnostics, and the last thing is we just did it. What was it? Calibration. The calibration. Those are the three main portions of diagnostics that you're going to want to use when you're troubleshooting the machine. Let's take a look at the service manual for one second.
So factory diagnostics includes four options. Calibration must be performed when any of these following parts are replaced. Control board, the basket, the actual spin basket. You change a mechanical basket, they want you to run it through calibration, okay? The drive assembly suspension, the suspension are the springs, the motor and shifter, and not performing calibration result in poor wash performance. So if you do not run a calibration, the machine might work but it may also not work properly. So they're gonna tell you to run through calibration. If you don't run it through calibration and you call tech support, say, yeah, I just changed this motor, it's not working right. They're gonna tell you, do this first, all right? Um, do not interrupt calibration, disturb washer or remove power. So if you're in the middle of calibration and it did not go properly, how do we fix that? Yes. Factory reset. Factory reset. We'd go to factory reset, do a factory reset of the board, going back to its original program, and then run the calibration again. So I've had some people tell me, oh, I was in the middle of calibration and, and there was a storm outside and the power went off. Well, clear that calibration that you did and do it over again. All right? Uh, Calibration must be run for two or four minutes, completes when the lid unlocks, okay? Uh, system information. System information, model number, serial number, connectivity, status, software, build date, use the right button to navigate through these screens. Some of these may also have additional information which can be accessed by selecting that screen. This may be access to system information, the following screens, which is basically what we were doing. Connectivity, SAID, displays machine specific SAID. That's what I said. That's basically the ID of the board. Remember those long numbers we were seeing? That's the SAID number, okay? Um, here's the SSID. Uh, these Acronyms have something to do, but we don't really do with that. That's more of what the factory deals with. We don't really deal with all those acronyms and everything else. Right. Fault history. Past machine faults may be viewed and cleared through this menu. Uh, fault error code display method. Fault codes displayed in the format of F and E. What's F and E? Fault and error. And then they give you the pound sign because it'd be F1, E3. So F1 may have three different types of problems with that fault and what error caused that fault. So on, on the display, let's see if I can find that in the manual here. Here's examples of some of those fault error codes. Uh, starting off with the first one. F zero E two machine had oversuds. What's oversuds? Too much soap. Um, customers not using the right soap. These machines don't use as much water as the older machines. So you must use detergent that has a little letters. Next time you go to the grocery store and walk down the aisle and look for detergents that have the H E on the box, which means high efficiency. That high efficiency detergent is a very low sudsing detergent. You know, when you wash your car, you want to get that nice soap suds when you're washing your car. We don't want all those suds in these machines because they don't fill up with as much water. So that excess soap would stay in the clothes. Okay. Overload. The overload it displays when the main control detects the load size that exceeds the washer capacity. Customer put. 10 tons of clothes in one washing machine, okay? So again, you wanna clear the code out and run the machine without the code to make sure that that error doesn't reappear. Uh, spin limited by water temperature. What? That the spinning cycle is limited by the temperature of the water? Fault is displayed when the water temperature is too high and have the spin at final speed. Speed will be limited to 500 RPMs. Why would they do that? 
Why, if the water was too hot, they're going to slow down the spinning cycle of the washing machine? A motor could overheat? Or no? What? A motor. The motor could overheat? No, because the motor is, it, this is belt driven, so the motor wouldn't even sense the temperature, yes. Of the fibers in the clothes? What about the fibers in the clothes? You got an idea? They're, they get weakened with, with the hot water? No, what happens is when we have a washing machine, everybody has a dryer nowadays, but back in the days, people don't use dryers. They just had a washer. What'd you do? You use clothesline, okay? Mm -hmm. At the end of the cycle, if it's hot water in the spin cycle, most washing machines use only cold water or maybe sometimes warm water on the final rinse. So we have something called a wash and we have something called a rinse. The wash could be any temperature, hot, warm, cold, and with these electronic machines, sometimes they can even be more accurate as to specific temperatures. But when we get to the rinse cycle, so we wash with soap and water, and we spin and drain that water out, we fill up a second time for rinse water. 90% of the machines out there, the water that comes in during the rinse is cold water. And that is to prevent two things. One, if we do hot water, some materials called uh, uh, resin fibered material, what they call a uh, molded sleeve. I forgot the name of it, it just escaped my mind right now. But in most of our shirts that we're wearing now, we have a seam here and we have a seam here to make this shoulder. Permapress, that's what it was. Oh, that I some remember. clothing, mainly women's clothing, that the material they use is stretched over like a mannequin and it's heated and creates this shoulder and it has no seams here or no seams here. It's all one fibrous material. It may have a seam on the sleeve, but it doesn't have a shoulder sleeve. So how do we create this curve is they set it on a mannequin or, or type of mold and they heat it to form that mold. So if we spin at a very high temperature with hot water and permanent pressed clothing, that could cause that sleeve to all of a sudden be like this now and it lost its curve because that hot water heated it up and then it deformed the clothing. Now the other thing is, is like I said, the clothesline, that when we spin with hot water and then the machine stops spinning, that causes wrinkles to set into the clothes, especially if the customer doesn't take it out right away. So if we do it with cold water, it relaxes the fabric and reduces the amount of wrinkles that are enclosed during the spinning cycle. That's why most of them use cold water, okay? Off balance load, nothing to, load detected when running, clean washer cycle. Fault display when clothes are detected in the basket, when the clean washer cycle, what's that mean? It's a, that's a cycle that actually cleans the basket itself. It's a cycle built in the washing machine just to clean itself, not to clean the clothes. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't know how well any of them work, okay? What happens inside of a washing machine is we have that metal inner basket and then we have an outer tub or tank that holds the water. And when you wash clothes, the soap helps the dirt float on the water. And then what happens, like an old bathtub, you know, what do you get that ring around the bathtub? It's time to clean the bathtub. Well, some of that stuff is like, slimy and scummy it just doesn't come off unless you scrub it and that's the same thing with washing machines but what they do that cycle for is to help to deodorize the washer where they have afresh a-f-f-r-e-s-h r-e-s-h and some other companies that they sell that you sprinkle a couple of these little pellets inside the washing machine and you run the washing machine and it helps to deodorize it so that your clothes don't smell damp and musty from the residue inside the washing machine. But some of you guys have been taking some of these washing machines apart. In the outer tub of that washing machine, you'll see on the older machines, they're gonna have buildup of scum and everything on there, and the cleaning cycle is not going to remove it. It's just not gonna come off. If it was that easy, you know, we could do that for everything, you know? <laughs> um, water ring. Fault display when too much residual water is detected. I don't know what that means. Like there's too much water left in the machine, it should have drained it all out. 
So I, I, I don't really know what that water ring is. I've never seen that before. It's got like a like a little double cross there. I gotta see if I can find that and get more information on that. OB pause, falls display when off balance get to, condition is detected after user interventions. What does that mean? Did something wasn't installed correctly or something? Not that something was installed, that the clothes were off balance. The user interventions some means like- may, Some people may stop the washer before it meets the cycle and add something. Something. Not so much adding, but if the machine was going through a cycle and when it agitates, no matter how well you distribute it, they move the clothes around. Sometimes two towels may bunch up here and two t-shirts over here. So now when it spins, part of the basket's heavier than normal. The customer intervention means that you realize that the machine was off balance. You might have heard it banging against the cabinet or may have saw that an off balance was registered on the display. So you lift the lid and you try to move the clothes around and then close it back and try to resume the cycle. But they're saying here that off, off balance, that is if the customer tried a couple of times to, to correct that off balance cycle, but they didn't fix it, now a fault code will come up. I'll give you an example. A former student of mine, she lived down the street from me and just the other day, uh, she had called me and said her washing machine was banging all around and everything. And I told her, usually the suspension or the shocks need to be replaced. I thought it was a top loader like this, but it happened to be a front load washing machine. So she had these little four shocks in a box. And luckily it was one of the older Whirlpool kinds. So you could just remove the lower panel and the shocks are right there. You didn't have to take the machine all apart. So I was able just within five minutes, three of the four shocks in that washer were completely broken. Now, she's an older lady and you know, her husband, and only the two of them, so it wasn't like they overload the washing machines. What do you think caused three of the four shocks on a front load washer to completely break? I should have taken pictures. Overload. What? Overload. I said they don't overload the machine, yeah. Not, not level? No, the machine was level, and she's had that machine for like 10 years. It just went out. She did too. Critique. No, what happened was on front load washing machines, um, let me just bring something up here so I can, uh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me, let me go here. On front load washing machines, we don't have any of those baskets apart out there, do we? I don't think so. Let me just look up in this part real quick. Front load washer spin basket. Now very rarely do, do they sell this part separately, but if you've pulled the basket out of the washing machine, this is the shaft that runs out the back when you're pulling these baskets out. You can see how this one here, I'll zoom in on it a little bit better, and how it has these three, we call it a spider. If it'll open, come on. I'll show you here while that's trying to load. But if you can see this spider here, dang it, here we go. You can see this spider here, that's the support. Well, when machines get older, they make this part of the basket stainless steel. It's probably one of the most expensive pieces inside the machine. But this piece here is not, it's garbage. I don't know any manufacturer that makes a real good support there. The shaft is nice, but the support is bad. And the bleach and the soap causes corrosion and it cracks. Mm -hmm. And what happens now is only two of the three are holding it. And so when it's spinning, that basket's pulling away from the shaft and causing all kinds of banging and, and off cycle. So before I even put her shocks on, I reached inside the machine and I felt the basket and moved the basket around and I could feel playing it, but none of the shocks were there holding the basket still. I says, I'm not sure, but I think your basket's damaged. And that's what caused these four shocks to break. I said, we need to install the shocks 
to see if this machine's working okay. So I installed the shocks, turned it on, and it started spinning fine. We're saying, oh yeah, well, it's working good, working good. And all of a sudden, it started going boom, 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 bang, 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 bang. <laughs> and at that point, I said, listen, these here are like a couple hundred dollars. Some are more expensive than that. Some are a little bit less, but not much. And then, you know, the labor would take, you guys have all pretty much taken the outer the outer tub out of a washing machine took it apart you know we would only do that if it's under warranty or extended contract or this is a two thousand dollar washing machine because you as a technician for that part to be 308 your retail your retail price is 308 so you probably pay about 260 or something like that so you make about 30 or 40 dollars in a part but you're going to charge two 250 to do that job because you yourself, remember, what do I tell you guys? When you go to pull it out of the machine, you need a second man or you're going to damage that washing machine. So we would only do it if the customer has an extended contract or it's under warranty. And that's what happened to her machine. The shocks were all broken. But again, that doesn't fix the problem. They were broke because it was another problem within the machine. So it's a rabbit hole again, too. Other parts could be broken. So what? It's a rabbit hole, so the other parts could actually be broken. Not so yeah. One, yeah, so uh, I mean, shocks to that, so. So I go to the customer's house, well you need four shocks, and then you're gonna need this basket. So now the parts went up to $370. And you know, so again, it isn't worth fixing it if it's, if it's too expensive to repair. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next fault, F1E1, the main control. The fault is displayed and indicating the main control fault, which they have tests for the Maytag or Whirlpool machines. Um, basically, the board's bad, but they do have some tests for you to go through that. Motor drive module over voltage. Fault is stored when the main control detects a problem in the motor drive. Capacitor's bad. Uh, the motor maybe had an excessive load and the motor drew too much power. That's what we would, we would have this error code here. Is it the motor that's the fault? Yeah. Maybe not. It could be a capacitor, it could be the control board. So they have these specific tests that you have to go through to determine that. I'm not gonna go through each one of these tests. Uh, F2E1, HMI stuck, fall the store indicate that the user interface is detecting a button is continuing activated. So these display buttons here, one of them you might press down and they might not come back up. It may be stuck in the down position. So if the fault detected that, you're just gonna change what? The user interface here. Okay. Uh, HMI disconnected, false place H HMI disconnected. That's very rarely gonna happen because this connects to the main board. This is how the, you as the customer or your technician communicate to the main board. And if the ribbon was disconnected, it would give that error. Mm -hmm. Here's a problem though. How would you get to that error if the ribbon's disconnected? Right. It may pop up while the customer's using the machine, but they might have unplugged it or something trying to get it to work again. And once they unplug it, plug it back, it might not start up again, depending on what buttons were not making connection or all of them weren't making connection. So that display won't work. And we have a bunch more. I'm not going to read every single one of these to you. I can give you copies of this or send it to you by email. But these are all the different errors in the machine. So they help you diagnose and troubleshoot. So if I had a, um, let's just go here, a locked rotor. What's a locked rotor? Is that the rotor for the brake? Nope. A motor has two main parts. We have a rotor and a stator. The stator is the electrical windings and the rotor is the part of the motor that rotates. A locked rotor means that the motor itself could not spin or rotate. So when this has happened, the turn of the motor is not moving, what's being actively done. Forget about what it says here. What would you do if you had a locked rotor error? This is the last one we're going to go over. What would you do if you had a a locked rotor air. Try to spin the tub and see if it spins freely or spin the belt. What'd you say, Marcus? The agitator. I'm sorry? The agitator or actuator, whatever. 
You, so you would what? Agitate? Yes. So you would go, would you go into diagnostics and just force the motor to run in a specific cycle? And I would probably do spin over agitate only because I'd have to wait for it to fill up before the motor would run. So if I go into diagnostics, I could go into the spin cycle or the agitation cycle, but I wouldn't want to do that because I wouldn't want to put water in there. I just want to see if the motor is working. I'd go into the spin cycle through diagnostics and tell that motor to run. And I'd watch what it does. And I'd see if it rotates. Now, if the motor don't work, we do have steps to test, but we can check one, if the motor is getting power, we can check the resistance value of the motor, and we can check the mechanical function, see if the motor's spinning or agitating. We could rotate the, the belt or the pulley to see if that's working. So in diagnostics, we would use this mode to check if the motor's locked up. If the motor's locked up and you can't move it, you change the motor. But that's what these error codes are, and that's what you would find when you go into these diagnostics. So these diagnostic cycles are going to help you with your troubleshooting. Okay? So I, I'm going to get a, maybe a better camera or just use my phone. I just like the fact of being able to have this display on the board so you can see it. I just don't like that it's that blurry. So i got to figure out a way to make that a little bit clearer. But my, my goal is to do every washing machine in here and go through the dryers and then go through refrigerators and show you guys the diagnostics that you can use in all these machines and how to use them. Do you have any questions about this diagnostics or anything about this machine? I was just curious, if you have a locked rotor, um, you might manually or test it and it runs for a while, but if, mechanic, if, 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 if that thing is drawing too much current, it might run this time, but it won't run the next time. Yeah, but we have we have a different error that says over current. Right. So, so if you if you test it and it has all the feeds going to it okay, mm -hmm. then a lock rotor would most likely be a mechanical problem. And, and sometimes it will run if you if you move it manually. Yeah. But if, if a motor run for a while and then when they shut it off, it's never going to. If the motor is not yeah. running and power is going through right. it, it's going to raise the amperage. And the motors, the control board is going to see that, and it could either indicate the the locked rotor, but that would most likely indicate an over amperage. The locked rotor. If we go to the schematic here, let me uh, let me just go to the schematic here. One thing, and I'll go over that. Schematic is usually like one of the last things in the book. So these are all the different tests that the uh, instructions was telling you. Just trying to find the schematic here. Okay. It's not in the back like most books. Let's go back to the index and find the schematic. Safety component access. It didn't show us wiring, did it? A oh, wiring diagram here. Uh, three dash it, chapter three, page three. Okay, so here's our wiring diagram. Let me rotate this. I know it's not the clearest diagram. Now here's our motor, okay? This motor here is our two windings in the motor. But if we look here, this is the shift actuator. What does the shift actuator do? 
Jose. It does agitate the spin. The only reason why I picked Jose because we were just the other day talking about the shift actuator and I pointed out to him. The motor here is here, but what does it say right there inside the motor? The speed sensor. So that the board knows it's sending power to the motor, but the motor's not running. It may not know by the motor not running, it may be able to determine the amperage draw of the motor, but the speed sensor or the rotation sensor of the cycle, the hall sensor that we were talking about, is built into a separate component other than the motor. So what if that speed sensor is bad? Would that give me a locked rotor error too, even if the motor's running? Yeah, it probably would not run if it cannot detect the speed. Right. Now that's why this guy, going back to that earlier problem that I told you where he changed the motor and he changed the board and neither one of them were working, he kept getting a sensor error. So he thought, it would, I, I said, well, the, the speed of that motor and the rotation of the motor is determined by the shifter. Change the shifter, he changed that. And what did they say? They want you to change the capacitor on the motor. Any one of my guys call me now, I tell them, order two capacitors, install one on the washer and keep one on your truck because that way you're gonna get more completes. Those of you guys that are individual technicians, when you run across multiple problems, and I'm not different problems, but you run across like within three months, you've changed a part two or three times. That's when you know, I need to carry this as truck stock. Yes, sir. So if the speed sensor goes bad, you have to like change the capacitor or? or no, on this particular model, oh, okay. what I say is if you're having a motor fault, any motor fault, the motor's not running, we're having an over amperage draw, we're having a lock rotor draw, first thing we do is we wanna check the motor. We can check it for resistance and see if the resistance is good on the motor. I'm gonna tell you, check the capacitor on this particular machine because of the problems the capacitors have given you. This isn't all machines. This is this machine specifically. Check it before you change it because the speed sensor itself is more of an electronic piece. You can't just check it with an ohmmeter and tell if it's good or bad. The only way you can check that is through the diagnostics of the machine where the machine goes and checks every component through the, through the cycle. So on this one is the only one I'm gonna tell you, hey, I would carry a capacitor. And the only reason why I say is this machine, whether it's the VMW or this one, the VMW is vertical module washer, we'll go over that one too. Um, that's a very, very common machine because it's under the Whirlpool name, it's under the Roper name, it's under the Maytag name, it may be under other names too, like the Samsung is very similar to this one. So you may see this machine three or four different brands or three different models, and it's all the same. So it's a very popular machine out there, but it's had its, had its issues. Not only has it had issues with the capacitor, but the suspension springs that hold that basket, they fail all the time. The springs are just poorly made and over a period of time they lose their, their tension and the whole basket and everything just bounces too much. Would they be all under the same part numbers for all those different brands or each brand? No, not even under the same brand like under Whirlpool because you can have a washing machine or you may have another washing machine that says heavy duty and the tub may be taller or shorter so the suspension springs aren't all the same for all of them. They're different. You might find one or two that might go for three different machines, but it's not like you could keep one whole set of suspension on your truck to, to cover all of them. But it is something you're gonna run across a lot. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay guys, go work on your projects or your modules.